Thank you very much, Kasia and uh, Emmanuel. And it's a pleasure to be uh, speaking to the group uh, today. I bring you warm greetings from Ghana. I know it's cold out there in the US, but it's quite warm here. It's been raining a bit and we are very happy for the rain. It's a pleasure to be here um, this evening or afternoon, wherever um, you are. So I'm going to be sharing my screen um, right now. And having engaged with um, Kasia and uh, Jessica and everyone on this, um, I looked through the different types of research that I had conducted to look at um, which fits best the topic that um, we are dealing with, co-creation. Um, Emmanuel went through a list of um, interests that I had in research. And today I'm focusing on something that we did on maternal and child health in Ghana. Um, the study was conducted a couple of years ago, but I chose this particular issue because the research did not just end on the shelf. Its results have found itself in policy and it's being used currently in the Ghana Health Service to improve outcomes of maternal and child health. So I've titled um, the talk, Engaging Stakeholders in the development and implementation of an innovation, innovative maternal and child health continuum of care card in Ghana. It's quite a long uh, title. Mm -hmm. So this, this piece of work was a partnership between the Japanese International Cooperative Agency, um, the Ghana Health Service and the Ministry um, of Health and the University of Tokyo. And it was a very fruitful partnership, let me put it in that way, which started way back in 2012. That was the first time that the government of Ghana and the government of Japan were having discussions about issues to do with maternal and child health in our countries. Uh, Ghana had learned a lot from some of the things, successes from uh, Japan and we felt that we could partner with them to help address some of the challenges we were facing. Now we titled the consortium, if I should put it in that way, Embrace Ghana, um, because we were pulling together healthcare professionals, we we're pulling together mothers, children, fathers, different community members. And we felt if we all embraced healthcare, we'll be able to achieve more success. So when we talk about continuum of care, what, what do we mean? In clinical care, we have people being taken care of because of HIV, nursing in palliative care for non-curable uh, conditions. And then it's care of an individual or a patient over time. So someone is suffering from HIV, the person needs some continuous care. Now in public health, continuum of care is necessary to avoid preventable conditions in maternal, neonatal, and child care. And it's often explained by the time and the space dimensions across which um, a child goes through or a, a woman goes through from pregnancy to delivery and after care. And we know that up to 67% of newborn deaths could be prevented if continuum of care is improved. So according to the National Safety Motherhood, um, Safe Motherhood uh, Protocols in Ghana, continuum of care is when a pregnant woman has antenatal care more than four times or attends antenatal care more than four times when she's pregnant, delivers in a health facility or is delivered by a skilled birth attendant, and then receives postnatal care within 48 hours, seven days, and six, uh, seven days, and then up to six weeks. So if the woman goes through all of these, then we say that the continuum of care link is complete. But if the woman breaks the cycle in between, then we say there are cracks in the continuum of care. So with this uh, in the back of our minds, I'm going to go through um, this process because I'll be referring to continuum of care 
throughout the presentation. And I'll be using the word COC. So if you hear COC, I mean continuum of care. So then we come to co-creation and Kasia has already explained what um, the investing means by co-creation. And I picked up some definitions online is the collaborative development of new value. It could be concept solutions, products and services together with experts and or stakeholders such as customers and suppliers. And in this case, we co-created what we call the continuum of care card with healthcare providers, um, frontline workers, those who engage directly with the mothers, with health managers, uh, people who are in charge of these frontline um, health managers and who supervise them, policy makers, because we look forward to having the research not sitting on the shelf, but being rolled out in policy and implemented uh, nationwide. And of course, community members. So the women that were engaging with when it came to uh, issues around continuum of care. So these were the people that we co-created this card with, and I'll show you the processes very soon. So in terms of embrace, and I did talk about embrace earlier on, when we talk about embrace within the context of the research that we did, we are referring to a package of health services that a mother and a baby receive from pregnancy through delivery to six weeks postpartum. And it includes antenatal care, like I said earlier on, delivery by skilled attendants and postnatal care. And all these were done within the context of normal maternal, neonatal and child health activities. So we did not do anything out of the ordinary. The only thing that was new was this card and I'll show it to you pretty soon. But whatever we did, we did within the remit of what the Ministry of Health does normally in delivering maternal, neonatal and child health. Now, at the time that we're discussing uh, government to government issues of maternal and child health, Ghana was facing a few challenges when it came to um, maternal and child health. There were inadequate supply of equipment and tools um, and challenges with capacities for emergency obstetric and neonatal care. The quality of care was quite poor. There was poor geographic access leading to delays in reaching care. So a mother is pregnant, getting transport even to the health facility was a big issue. And in some of the very, very remote areas, Sometimes you got transport just once a week on market days. The referral systems were quite poor and there was kind of a poor attitude of healthcare workers towards the services that they were rendering. And there were several demand side barriers leading to poor health seeking behavior, several sociocultural factors. And in Ghana, there are so many myths and misconceptions about pregnancy. So there are issues about if you are pregnant and um, you should not be eating eggs, otherwise your child will become a thief. Or issues about if you are pregnant and you are having challenges, then it means you, you went behind your husband um, and were cheating on him. So you needed to go through the pain. And it is only after you have confessed whatever you did that you'll be relieved. And so it, there's a lot of delay in seeking healthcare um, when such, some of these issues um, come to bear. Also, at the time that we were conducting the studies, the indices were quite bad. Um, neonatal mortality rate um, in the early 90s um, was 29, um, was sorry, was 40. It reduced gradually to 29. And as at 2019, it had gone down uh, to 23.1. The infant mortality rate at the time we were dis having these discussions was 80 and it reduced to 52. And then in 2019 is 33.9. Uh, the under five mortality um, rates at the time was 78. And that has reduced to 46.2 um, recently. And the maternal mortality rates 
um, was about 380 per thousand and currently it's about 308. So we've made a few strides, but at the time that we're discussing these studies, the indices were pretty bad and we felt there was a need to be able to deal with some of these issues in a more holistic way. At the time, Ghana had two separate books, one for maternal health records and one for child health. And you know that a mother is supposed to come to the health facility when she delivers with her baby and with the baby's health records. And because the two books were separate, sometimes the mother will leave one or the other. Information is recorded in one, not recorded in the other. And so it was difficult to really track the progress of the woman and the child at the same time. But these two books were provided free of charge to a woman who was pregnant and then to a child uh, once the child is delivered to be able to track their health. So we decided to have what we call the Ghana Embrace Implementation Research Project. And EMBRACE actually is an acronym for ensure mothers and baby regular access to care. And if you remember, I talked earlier on about the challenges that we were facing when it came to maternal, neonatal, and child health. So our aim basically was to create feasible and sustainable packages of interventions to improve these uh, maternal, neonatal, and child health outcomes through ensuring continuum of care. Like I said, mothers were not I mean, doing what they were supposed to do. Health workers were also not doing what they were supposed to do. But we felt that through this research, if we're able to ensure continuum of care, we could improve the indices. To put in place a package of interventions and test them in rural settings where access to healthcare was a bit of a problem. And then also to disseminate the findings and lessons learned to the wider global community. And we did quite a bit of that. So why did we choose implementation research? And we felt that this was the most appropriate um, design to use because of the fact that one, it is systematic um, and it is systematic to help recognize, understand and address the health system and implementation bottlenecks. So we are dealing with maternal and child health. What are the challenges? How do we understand them and how do we address them? And then we felt that using this approach will help us identify optimal implementation options in the settings in which we were working and to promote the uptake of research findings into policy and practice. Secondly, it is also demand driven. So the research questions are really based on problems that are identified through engagement with relevant implementers and stakeholders. So the people I talked about uh, when it came to co-creation of knowledge um, in doing work on maternal, neonatal, and child health. So we used this approach, uh, the design for implementation research. It was done in three phases. We had the pre-implementation phase, the intervention phase with continuous monitoring of our activities and the final evaluation. So for each phase, we had a different study design. We used both qualitative and quantitative methods. We carefully chose our study population and the sample, and we went ahead over a period of maybe two years uh, and a bit to be able to conduct the entire study. So we, we went through five phases in the EMBRACE research. We did a situation analysis to understand what was on the ground. Then we worked together with our partners and stakeholders to develop an intervention package. We did a baseline survey, mainly quantitative, um, a year after. Then we did a, cl a cluster randomized control trial for about a year where we put the interventions in place and monitored. And then we did the impact evaluation in 2015. So by a period of two years, uh, we conducted the entire study. The work was done in, in Ghana in three distinct geographical locations, 
Navrongo, which is in the Upper East, the topmost part of the country, um, Kintampo, which was in the Middle Belt, and then Dodoa, which uh, was in the um, Southern sector of the country. Now, these three locations are health and demographic surveillance sites. So we are monitoring the populations over time. And in 2012, uh, we had been monitoring each of these districts for more than five years. In fact, Navrongo had been doing it since the early 90s. And then we did we selected these sites because we were sure of a stable um, population base that we could follow over time and be able to track. And incidentally, the three research centers in the Ministry of Health were located in these demographic surveillance sites. And so we felt that we had the research um, capacity to be able to do this. And also by virtue of the fact that they were geographically located and had distinct characteristics, um, it would help us be able to measure the outcomes that we were looking um, for. So in the Upper East region, we had a mix of health facilities. We had some um, hospitals, we had um, health centers, and we had um, community level clinics. In, in, in Kintampo, which was in the middle belt, we didn't have that many health facilities. And in Dodoa, we had a mix of, of health facilities. So the formative research was conducted between July to um, September 2013. Um, and then we had, it was a cross-sectional study. Um, we had 1,500 women who had given birth between January 2011 and uh, April 2013. And for the qualitative, we used focus group discussions and in-depth interviews. And we targeted women, their partners, mother-in-law, sorry, this is mother-in-law, not mother-in-law, health administrators, health workers, and traditional birth attendants. Now, what did we find? We noticed um, in the situation analysis that women were actually attending antenatal care religiously. 83% of our women were attending. But when it came to skilled delivery, we just had about 76.2% of the women delivering under skilled attendance. And when it came to postnatal care, it was even worse. So there were cracks in the continuum of care. And you can see um, why we put this up there. So if 83% of the women attended antenatal care, why didn't we have the same number having skilled delivery? And why didn't we have the same number having postnatal care? There were several issues around there. When we look at all the factors pulled together and did the analysis, we found out that just 8% of the women completed the continuum of care. And you can see in this chart what is happening in here. So antenatal care is high. Facility delivery is not that high, except in Navrongo, where earlier on I had mentioned they have quite a number of health facilities out there. Now, postnatal care within 48 hours was quite low because even though some of the women delivered in the health facilities, they insisted they needed to go home just after delivery. They didn't want to say, and there were several issues why. Um, they felt that if they delivered at home, they had a warm meal, they could have a warm drink, they had the family support, but really when they delivered in a health facility, the environment was quite, um, should I say, strange to them. Um, and they didn't have access to the, the kind of um, family support that they would get. Now, when it came to postnatal care within two weeks, the figures went quite um, up a bit uh, because some of the women then decided to come to the health facility to have their children looked at. But PNC at six weeks was very high. In Ghana, usually, that is the time where the child is deemed to be grown enough or healthy enough or has been deemed to stay on earth. So if your child does not stay up to six weeks, then it means that the child was not meant to stay. And that was the first time that a, a young mother is allowed to take her child out to show to the public. 
So you see a lot of young women wearing white and bringing their children just basically to show everybody that they were pregnant, but they've delivered and they have a brand new baby. So PNC at six weeks was a big deal, um, but the other others were not so much of interest to them. So the major concern was that COC completion was very, very low. And it, it, it confirmed our fears that we had at the time that we were initiating the discussions with the group. So what other things did we find? We looked at factors that negatively associated with continuum of care, some barriers to continuum of care, and then we picked on some promoters for continuum of care. So what were some of the factors that are negatively associated with continuum of care? The low education that our mothers had. So um, at the time we were having discussions, uh, very few of our mothers were very educated. Their partners were not that educated and they had multiple children. Uh, the marital status was not very clear. So you had people uh, cohabiting, uh, some living with their partners, others not. There was not that much family support and it took a long time to arrive at the health facilities. Other barriers when it came to facility delivery were financial difficulties. Even though there was a policy for free maternal care, there were certain costs that the mother had to bear. Of course, the long distances, the attitude of the health workers. I've talked about some of the local beliefs and lack of preparedness for the delivery. So some of the women actually just came as they were without a, a little bag with stuff for the baby and just appeared um, to be delivered. Um, a lot of ignorance about how to take care of themselves, what to eat um, before um, delivery and perception of being well. Um, and so no need to come to the health facility. But then we also um, saw within these challenges, some possible promoters for continuum of care. Some of our women had quite easy access to um, our health facilities. And when they arrived, there were professionals available to be able to take care of them and the equipment to manage the complications. And then also some positive attitude of some of our healthcare workers. So we, we actually took advantage of some of these things to be able to look at the kind of um, intervention packages that we wanted to put together for this um, study. So there were a few issues, like I talked about, we're asking ourselves, can our women really understand the information in English, which is written in the maternal and child health handbook? So the handbook I showed to you was in English. Everything was written. And it was the nurse basically who wrote in the book and gave to the mother as to whether she understood what was in the book. We didn't know. But by virtue of the fact that um, about 30% of the women um, were not formally educated and just about 26% of them had had primary education was a matter of concern with interpreting what was written in the handbook. The second issue was do health workers actually record all the information in the handbook? Now, having gone through our records, we realized that when it came to total antenatal clinic visits, 12% um, of the women had not had this information recorded for them. Um, gestation at the last hemoglobin check for 35% of the women, this had not been recorded. Uh, for tetanoid texoid uh, immunization, 26% of the women had not had this recorded and 20% had not had their blood pressure recorded. Now, what we, do, we didn't know at the time was whether the blood pressure was taken, whether the woman had had her immunization, her TT immunization, whether her HB was checked and it was just not recorded, or whether these were not checked and that was why um, these were not recorded in the book. So you can appreciate the fact that we had challenges. So we're asking ourselves, how can we improve continuum of care through the effective use of the maternal and child health handbook. So these are the existing handbooks that we had. And there were challenges um, with recording and with the educational level of the mothers who were using them. I'm talking about mothers in rural areas. 
we felt that if we had an innovation to this, maybe it could work in the interest of both the mothers and the healthcare providers. So for the main intervention, we, are, we were interested um, in determining the effectiveness <clears throat> of the intervention packages on COC completion rates. And we wanted to evaluate the impact of the improved COC completion rates on maternal, neonatal, and child health outcomes. And that was for the health system level. And when it came to the research, we wanted to evaluate the process of adapting and implementing the intervention packages in the existing health system. So our targets for these interventions were women, all pregnant women during the intervention period. Any woman who arrived at the health facility between October 2014 and September 2015 was a target. And secondly, any woman who delivered during the intervention period and at most six weeks prior to the beginning of the intervention period was a target or was included. For the maternal, neonatal and child health services, our targets were the doctors, the midwives, the nurses, the community health officers, community health nurses, working in a public or a private health facility in the districts in which we were um, operating. So we were expecting that if all things were equal and were able to implement things properly, we were hoping to increase the COC completion rate from 8% to about 50% within the year, to increase postnatal care rate from about 26% uh, percent to more than 55%, to decrease maternal and neonatal complications requiring hospitalization, to decrease neonatal mortality rates, and then evaluate the implementation process for sustainability. And I cannot overemphasize the fact that we did not want the research to stay on the shelves. So developing the card was an intensive process. We thought of an idea you can see our Japanese colleagues and are sitting together discussing what we felt could go into the COC card. And one thing we did not want to do was to develop a card that was completely different from the indicators that were in both the maternal and child health handbook. So whatever we did was based on information in those two books. Now we designed it and then we had to pretest, go back and forth several times with our health workers and community members, and even with the researchers to try to see whether what we had developed would work. And then we trained our health workers on the use of the COC card. So they knew the indicators um, in, the, in the handbooks. And so we took them through a process of how to use the card in conjunction with the, the books. And then we did a lot of community sensitization, engaging the community, trying to get them to understand what we're thinking about, getting their questions and concerns, and then going back to refine and redevelop um, the, the card. So it took us, um, let me say, maybe close to six months to be able to develop um, this card. So this is what we started off with initially, um, a simple card um, just with a few boxes and some text. And when we took it to the community, um, it was like, this is no different from what we have in the other book. Um, we want to see things that we can relate to. And so we went on and readjusted the card to have a few more pictures, to have uh, pictures showing which stage the woman was um, at which time. And we had sections on the continuum of care. We had sections on education, uh, preparing the mother for um, delivery. And then we still pre-tested this. And then we had concerns from the health workers saying, um, we need to check the HB. We need to check um, all kinds of vitals of the woman. So and we went back to be able to further refine this card. We took it to the community. We took it back to the healthcare providers. And it seemed to be a good match for what um, everybody was interested in. The new thing was that we created space for telephone number so that the health worker could have the telephone number of the mother and the mother could also have a telephone number of the care provider 
um, to be able to reach um, each other. So all these things were in the maternal handbook. The difference is that you had it on one sheet and you could track the progress of the mother and the growth of the child um, throughout the period from pregnancy up to six weeks postnatal. Now, one of the interesting things was the gold star that we stuck on the spaces. And you could see from the card that there's um, the first visit, the second visit, the third visit, and the fourth visit. And so what we said was, what we reward should we give to a mother who has met all the criteria? Uh, there were different suggestions. Somebody said, give her soap, give her this. But we wanted something that the mother could pride herself in. And we remember that when we were all in school, if you, you, you did very well, you got a star in your, in your book. And we felt, let's try something like that. The mothers could relate to it and we could also um, relate to it. And then the issue about what color star should we choose? And that is where the issue of gold came in. Gold is a Ghanaian identity. The star is our pride symbol. And so we chose a gold star and it made the woman quite excited to think that they, they were women of gold and they would get a gold star for performing well. So we chose the gold star. It was just stickers that were designed in that way. And when a mother attended um, uh, uh, an antenatal visit on time, she got a gold star. So here we are with the detailed card. So this card was developed put in the middle of the maternal and uh, health record book. If you attended antenatal care on time and delivered at a health facility or received um, uh, skilled attendance at birth, you got a gold star. Now, if you attended but did not attend on time, you got an orange star. And if you didn't attend at all, it was left blank. But in our education, we encouraged the gold star and did not encourage the orange star. So you find out that some of the mothers after getting all gold stars, they were very excited and it became a source of pride in the communities. And people used to, uh, some of the men used to ask their wives, how come you don't have all gold stars? So it was quite an exciting uh, process to go through. So that's the gold star and that's the, the orange star. Great. So like I've been saying, the COC card was to encourage on-time visits. We didn't want situations where women came, but not on the time that had been scheduled. So for each visit, the health worker will tell them, your next visit is at, on this date. And we expected them to be able to attend at the particular time. If you missed it a day or two, that was fine. But some of them really missed it for long periods of time. Everything was done according to national protocol. We talked about scheduled dates and then the actual visit date. So we, the nurse would write what the scheduled date was and then she would write the actual date that the mother arrived. And then if you arrived on time, you got your beautiful um, gold star, which was the incentive. Then apart from giving the gold star, we use this to educate the mothers on continuum of care to say that it's important to attend all your antenatal care services four times plus, make sure that you have skilled delivery and I have postnatal care three times. We educated them on the essential services, the fact that they needed to have their blood tested, they needed to have their malaria prophylaxis, uh, take their tetanus um, injection and check their blood group. We also gave them health education on birth preparedness, early and exclusive breastfeeding and family planning. And we taught them how to identify danger signs uh, and to have further details um, recorded. Um, and then also, like I talked about the phone number for emergency care. So the COC card was one of the intervention packages. We had the orientation, we had 24 hour retention at the health facilities, ensuring that their family member could be there uh, for them to have hot water, have a, a hot drink, and then 48 hours postnatal care because they delivered in the health facility and the uh, community health nurse 
did a home visit. So this was the compendium of packages that we put together. But our, our real stress was on the continuum of care card because that is the one with which we had a lot of engagement with uh, the mother. And we're looking at the end of the day at COC completion rates, uh, PNC within 48 hours, um, and any complication which required more than 24 hours um, attention. So we oriented our health workers on the different training, um, on the different activities, and we developed several training manuals and we took them through all of this and they did a lot of role play. We held community debates um, to explain everything that was going on. And we engaged in serious monitoring and supervision. Um, we tied this to the routine monitoring visits of the healthcare providers so that we didn't create a different supervision schedule outside what was going on um, in the health facility. So the interventions were implemented within a couple of, of months from October um, 2014 to about June uh, 2015, we had distributed about 13,000 COC cards and those were in active uh, circulation. And by the end of the intervention period, we had distributed close to about 21,000 um, uh, COC cards. <clears throat> So when it came to um, completion of COC, um, we realized that the indicators had gone up. So if you take ANC, it had moved from 71% to, um, there, were, there were increases in across the different sites. So in Kintampo, it was around 71% and in Navrongo, the highest 88%. Uh, Skill delivery had gone up um pnc 48 hours uh, like i talked about kintampo did not have that many health facilities and so that wasn't that high but at least it had improved because we managed to get the health worker to go to the home of the mother uh, pnc at first week had gone up pnc at six weeks had gone up and overall um continuum of care had increased to about 47 uh, percent now, one interesting thing that we noticed was that in the intervention areas, things were going on fine. However, in the control areas, the health workers had heard about the COC card and they were um, not actually using the card, but educating the mothers a bit more on what they were supposed to do. So we saw that there was an increase also in the um, control areas when it came to COC um, completion rate. It was a nice thing to see that it had spread, but then you ask yourself in a research setting, um, this whole thing about um, contamination and it's something that we observe. But of course, this is implementation research, real life, and there was very little we could do about it. Now, in conducting this, we, we found out that receiving the COC card actually improved COC completion. And we're quite happy uh, with that. For those who received the card, 52% of them um, completed. And for those who didn't, it was 35% of them um, who completed in the intervention arm. And it was lower in the control arm. Um, we, we noticed that receiving the COC card improved uptake of PNC within 48 hours. And we can see the differences in both the intervention and the control arm. And receiving the COC card improved uptake of postnatal care around one week. Um, and these are the rates that we, we see up there in excess of 70%. Uh, and the overall coverage um, was quite high and we were quite happy with what had gone on. So um, do women want to use the COC card again? Yes. They, they felt that they really wanted to use it. Did they stay in the health facility for 24 hours after delivery? Yes, and it was quite high, 92.4%. Um, and we have some quotes from the um, qualitative aspect. Um, this, is, this is a health worker saying, before the interventions, 
uh, usually mothers came to take the antenatal card and did not come back until delivery or came back with many complications. But now they receive antenatal care four times and this prevents the complications, which is a matter of concern for the midwife. Um, another one, the health workers were saying, now the husbands understand that delivery should be assisted by a skilled birth attendant and they call us to come to the home. So when they cannot arrive at the health facility, the health worker actually moved to the home and we're happy that the males were involved. Then also the follow-up. So uh, another community health nurse said, we have good communication with other health facilities. When a mother from our area delivers at another facility, they call us to follow up for PNC within 48 um, hours. And the health workers were quite excited about the card. It's in pictures, everything is on it, and it's easy to educate the mothers without flipping through several pages uh, to be able to educate um, the mothers. And this young girl here um, was saying when she properly follows the COC card and does good behavior, she gets a gold star and she's, she's, she really wants to get all gold stars uh, to be able to show everybody what a proud mother um, she is. The health workers were saying it reduced their workload because you just take one card and you track the mother across and you spend more time with, with the mother. And then also the issue of mothers not staying at the health facility after delivery um, had been kept because now they stayed there and they were able to provide whatever services that they, they had to provide. And then they also had improved communication. So they set up a, a WhatsApp group um, and then they were happy that the mothers were able to contact them because they had their phone numbers. That's the WhatsApp group I was talking about. So they were able to share information across um, and be able to engage with their other um, colleagues in other health um, facilities to support them in taking care of them. So the unique features of this card were that women and health workers got to see COC status at a glance. And regardless of literacy level, something that we we're concerned about in the beginning, women could understand their own health information. It really facilitated interactions amongst women, family members and health workers and created a new role model of gold star mothers in our rural um, communities. However, there were a few limitations. Um, it contained minimal information on services and complications. And so it should be used as part of the maternal and child health handbook. And that is why we have it in the middle um, of the book. Sometimes it could increase the workload on daily routines um, of the health worker um, at first antenatal service. And sometimes the sticker can be replaced with an alternative um, example, a stamp. And in the rollout in the country, we replace the sticker with a stamp. So we made some recommendations that it's a user-friendly tool. Um, it can, it's, it's relevant for other countries where COC remains poor and it can, the maternal and child health handbook can be used more effectively if the card is integrated into the handbook. I talked about the fact that we did not let the research end on the shelves. So Ghana developed a new handbook, which was a combination of both the maternal and the child health book. You remember in the beginning, there were two separate books, but we combined them. And this is the COC card, which is, has been printed actually in this book. And so it is part of this new book. And this is what excites us most, that we did some work, engaged our key stakeholders, and the work did not end on the shelves and it landed in policy. So we acknowledge all the people who were part of this entire process. It was a huge endeavor and we really acknowledge everybody, the districts in which we worked, our colleagues from Japan, uh, the government of Japan and the government of Ghana um, and all the women and community members who worked with us to ensure that this happened. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Emmanuel, are you going to join me? Hey, yes. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, uh, Dr. Chapong, I was mispronouncing your name. Uh, so thank you, Emmanuel, for uh, 
modeling the correct pronunciation. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, it's now open for, uh, for questions and um, please feel free to type them into the Q&A or directly into the chat. I noticed that there's one question in the Q&A, but I, unfortunately uh, it gets cut off for me when I open it. Emmanuel, are you able to see it? Yes. Okay, please go ahead then. All right, so um, Dr. Japon, there's a question by Dr. Nyamiche that says that um, he really is thankful for the presentation, but I'm curious about how traditional communal knowledge is prioritized in knowledge co-creation as context specific communal knowledge remains a key element of practice, especially in rural communities. So um, I think he wants you to maybe reflect on that for us, how communal, traditional communal knowledge is prioritized in the work that you do. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if you know the Ghanaian society is really steeped in a lot of uh, traditional beliefs and practices. And I think I alluded to it um, sometime in the beginning um, of the work. But what we do is that we don't just dismiss some of these cultural practices, but we use them to be able to educate and engage the community, okay? So there are things about um, if you are pregnant and you eat eggs, your child will become a thief, but egg is a protein, okay? So we educate them on the benefits of having egg um, that it does not land your child being a thief. So we, we, we don't just dismiss the knowledge that they have because then it shows a kind of disrespect to the community, but you acknowledge the fact that yes, this is what they believe in and then use it to be able to turn things around for, for them. For instance, in the work that I showed, they were concerned that if they come to the health facility, they will not be treated well, they will not, give, uh, they will not get the um, kind of care that they needed. Um, their spouses were not allowed to be there and no other family was a member was allowed to be there. So then if the woman is struggling and she needed to confess to somebody, there was nobody there she could confess to. But we had to say that, well, the, the whole issue about going through pain in childbirth has nothing to do with being promiscuous, but could be complications or is a natural part of the birth. And they, they are given the encouragement to be able to to go through it. So these are the ways that we, we use to uh, dispel some of these things um, during the course of the work that we do. Thank you. There is another question uh, and this one comes from our own Jessica Skates. Jess, would you like to ask it yourself? Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Jiapong. I, I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, I noted that it was clear that mothers thought that care was important and you showed at six weeks, um, the time when Ghanaian culture deems it appropriate for moms to take their babies out in public, that the care seeking increased exponentially um, when compared with 48 hours after delivery. But then, and then you also mentioned that you did manage to get healthcare workers to go to the homes of the mother of the mothers for the 48 hour visit. So I was wondering if you could speak to, to that and how much continuum of care increases if home visits are norm during that 48 hour period um, instead of women traveling to visit the doctor at a healthcare facility. Okay, so thank you very much. As, as I mentioned in the beginning, in some of our study areas, they didn't have that many health facilities. So access to the health center was poor and the mothers stayed in their homes and delivered. Now, after they delivered, they, they were not contacting any health worker. They didn't have a phone number. They didn't have anything to contact um, the health provider with. And so we defined skilled birth attendant as either coming to deliver at the health facility or calling as a skilled attendant to your home within 48 hours of delivery to be able to take care of you and make sure that your needs are taken care of. And that's how come we, we charted the increase in skilled birth attendants. So she had the service provided to her in the home. Now in Ghana, we have a system of community health officers who are supposed to do a 90 day cycle within a certain catchment area. 
they are supposed to go to the home, um, visit the mother, the home, and if there's a pregnant woman, engage with her. If there's a child that needs immunization, give the immunization. But prior to this, it wasn't done very effectively. And the health workers complained about not having fuel and, and not having a motorbike to be able to go. So in fact, as part of the project, we made sure that each of the districts had a motorbike and fuel was provided to ensure that they made the visit to the home. And I think that contributed to the increase um, in, in um, postnatal care 48, 48 hours. But like I said, for the six weeks, the mother wanted to come out and show everybody that she had a brand new baby. For instance, when I had my, my first child, um, I didn't have a help, I didn't have anybody. Within um, three weeks, I was tired of sitting in the house. So I bundled the, ch the child up one day and went to church. And I was reprimanded by the elderly woman in church for bringing my three week old baby to church. She's not six weeks and you cannot bring her out, you know? But I'm like, what's the big deal? She's a baby and I've wrapped her up well and brought her to church. So, you know, you, when you are faced with some of these challenges, you end up just recoiling and, and being at home. But of course, when the education is better, you are able to take charge of some of these things. That's right. So thank you for that. So we have another question from Seth. So um, Seth said, this is an excellent and important work and thank you for presenting this. Um, his question specifically is, is it possible that women who miss a few visits may feel shame for not coming, i.e. having fewer stars, and that might lower their likelihood of visiting again? So maybe if you could reflect on whether you saw instances of women feeling the shame for not coming and any fewer stars for that. Um, the few instances we noticed that the men actually brought them to the facility because they were coming to question the health worker as to why their wife did not get a gold star. And then the health worker explained it was because maybe they didn't come on time and used the opportunity to educate the husband to encourage the woman to come. So there may have been, but we didn't encounter um, any of that. All we knew was that quite a number of men were coming to the health facility to find out why their wives did not have the gold stars. And they were initially quite upset with the health workers and felt the health workers were not giving their wives the stars where they deserved it. So I don't know if I may have to maybe utilize my power as a moderator here, a co-moderator here to ask my own few questions. So I have, this is really excellent and thank you so much for um, presenting this insightful research to us, Dr. Japong. So my question, I have two questions here and maybe I'll start at the question, but the first one has to do with, with such an excellent findings that you found in this research. Most of the work that we face, especially those researchers who are from here, Oftentimes we come into our communities, we gather this rich data, we organize this wonderful research, we have our findings and then we present this at different conferences and then wonderful publications from there. But the communities that we gather this data from, we don't often share our findings with. So my question is, what are some of the best ways, some best practices that we could learn from in order to share some of our research findings with the communities that we gather the data from? How do we become better at this? rather than just sharing our research with just all these international experts, rather than the communities themselves who really need it. Okay, so that, that's a very, very important question uh, that you have asked. And I think it's, it's the, sometimes it's the type of study design that you choose. If you are conducting an experimental trial, if you are a classic randomized controlled trial, you really are not in a position to know what your final result is till the end, you know? And so after two years, after three years, you are now going to break the code uh, to be able to do something, by which time the partners have moved back to where they belong and the researchers have moved on to another research uh, uh, project. But look at the design that we chose, implementation research, you didn't have a choice but to engage with the community all the time. Okay, and we, we incorporated within this design regular interaction. So whenever we even had presentations at national level, we made sure that we invited some of these mothers 
from the different districts to come to Accra. In fact, some of the mothers had never even been to Accra before. And for them, it was just something out of the ordinary. And Accra is the capital um, of, of Ghana. So we put in the effort to engage and I would encourage all of us not to be in a hurry to just collect data and zoom out. At the end of the day, we want to make sure that we are making a difference. So include as part of your timeline, time to go back to the community and give back to them. We owe it a duty to people we collect data from. So it shouldn't just be an issue of, I need to get my PhD and I'm a postdoc and I need to finish. So I'm in a hurry and then you leave it. So most of the time we, we collect the data, go away and we expect those in the country to go and do the dissemination, but that takes time and that also is cost intensive. So let's budget for it and let's make time for it so that people um, respect us. Uh, they expect us to come back because when we go to introduce ourselves, we say we will come back, but we never do. And then a, a different group goes and that second group is in trouble because they just see all of us as the same. So I'll just encourage all of us when we do our, our project plans and our budgets, include time to go back to the community um, and include a budget line for, for that. Um, I don't know if I'm going to ask my last question. I'll stop talking. I'm not going to abuse my power here. So my last question, which I think really dovetails very well into your comment about partnership and budget. I know, I'm not sure so many people are aware of this, but last year or last two years, I had a wonderful privilege of working with you on a grant proposal. And then through that process, you really forced me to think seriously about how we build partnership with our local expert in Sub-Saharan Africa. And partly because I think it forced me to think of how we budget for our time in research project. But when we are dealing with our local partners, we often forget about that. And I'm asking, what do you think are some of the best practices for us to build a meaningful and fair collaboration with the local partners that we engage with? What would you say are some of the practices that we from especially this place should start embodying if we really want to be fair in knowledge co-production? You raised a very, very important and uh, uh, should I say a, a sensitive issue? Let me put it. Let me put it that way. Um, a month ago, we had a group of people wanting to collaborate with our university, and they sent us a memorandum of understanding. And we went through the MOU, and I raised a couple of issues. And um, I was told, "Well, this is fixed, and it cannot be changed." And so, and I said, "No, this is not the kind of partnership we want." You cannot sit somewhere and dream something for me and then expect that I should take it just like that. No, we would go ahead and look for other partnerships that have equal respect for us because we are all scientists. We are all researchers. Yes, you may have the money out there, but we also have certain skills that we are using out here. We need each other. You need us and we need you. So we should have mutual respect for each other when it comes to things like this. If I refuse to engage the community, if I refuse to take you to the places you need to go to, you don't have research. You may have the money, but you will not have your research. So I think it's mutual respect and, and partnership and looking at things realistically. Um, if, 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 if you want to work with us, let's put the cards on the table. Let's look at everybody's role. You have a PhD, I have a PhD. Yes, you could write the proposal and you could get funds easier, but I know the system and I know how to take you around and I know how to ensure that you get the data. It's an equal partnership and we need to look at things in that way. I wish there was a like a clapping uh, thing <laughs> that, that we could, uh, I, I, I don't think it's here. Um, thank you for sharing that. Though that's 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 really important um, to to voice. So so thank you for sharing that. I'm wondering. I, I don't see any questions uh, from our audience. So please continue to think um, about 
uh, the presentation and, and what uh, Dr. Japong is saying, um, but maybe I can uh, jump in and ask another question here. And I like to think about nuts and bolts types of uh, things uh, with respect to how things are done. And it struck me, and, and, and this is, please correct me if you think this is, this is an incorrect um, perception, but it struck me in, in our, our previous presentations, we've uh, had people talk about uh, co-production of knowledge that was mar much more local. It was um, a, an academic working with a, a local community or, or local partners, multiple partners. But it struck me that what you're describing is kind of a, a really wide spanning co-production from um, health system, uh, health system, academics, um, international uh, collaborators or partners or, or uh, international philanthropy, if for lack of a better word. And, and also you brought in the community and you, you said yourself that this was really difficult to coordinate. I'm just wondering if you could talk, talk about that, what the coordination of that looked like, um, having to, to be partnering with, with your Japanese partners who were, who were thinking through the design of the booklet and then bringing in the community as well as the health, health workers and hearing what, you know, what they were um, saying about the design of this. Can you, it, that's straddling quite a lot. And I'm wondering if you could speak to that. Okay, thank you very much. So um, at the time we conducted this study, I found myself in a unique position where I was a researcher, but I worked in the Ministry of Health. Okay, so I understood the health system. And I had been working in the particular district in which we conducted the studies for several years. Now, as a, a researcher heading a research institute in the Ministry of Health, my mandate was to link up directly with the district health system. So I was part of the district health management team and the district director of health services was part of the research team. So we work together and we plan together. So if we had a research project to work on in developing the proposal, we sat with the district health management team and they told us the reality on the ground. So we didn't sit in the office and think through a research project and say, hey, this will be working well for the people in the community. We went with them to say, this is the idea we have. You are on the ground and you know what the health system is. How will this work? With our Japanese collaboration, it was a Ghana-Japan um, collaboration. So government of Ghana versus government of Japan. Government of Ghana, having seen the Japanese combined maternal health book and saying, how can we use this in Ghana? Because we see that things appear to be working in your country. So we had people at the national level talking to people at, in Japan at the national level, then you had University of Tokyo, and then you had us as researchers and academics also talking the same language. So we were linked in that way. When it came to engaging with the health system, our Japanese collaborators left it to us to be able to engage because they knew that we knew the system. And when it came to academic issues and publications, we had a common platform where we discussed the titles of the papers and what we should be working on. And we had a list of authors. So if on this paper, we had a Japanese collaborator who was first author, we would have a Ghanaian who would be the senior author and in that way. And we we're working in three districts. So we, we had a plan about who to do. So we've actually just um, had a paper uh, released two days ago and we had one of our Japanese on this same study, which was long ago. So we had our Japanese collaborator first, I'm the second author. We have another one said because of the agreements that we had right at the beginning. So it's a matter of, like I talked about, mutual respect and understanding everybody's role and what they are bringing to the table. And that kind of makes the partnership um, easy. So going to the local communities, we speak the language. So when you arrive in a community and you are speaking the language, they know this is one of us. And then because of the design, we were going back several times 
And so they recognized us as part of the whole process and didn't see us as people who just got their, their little uh, notebooks and came and collected data and disappeared. And we never saw them um, anymore. So yes, it, it was a lot of effort, but everybody understanding their roles and playing what roles they needed to do helped to make this um, work quite well, I would say. I think there's one more question here, which I think could sum up this presentation for us very well. And in your talk, one of the things that I really loved was the fact that you were not just engaging in traditional research, but research that is geared towards policy changes. And so we have a question here that says that, and this is from my colleague, Professor Samina Raja. And then her question is, what advice do you have for early career faculty or doctoral student who are just beginning their journey of community-centered research to transform policy. Could you please share with us one strategy that has worked for you and some things to avoid when we are trying to engage in research to change policy? Hmm. Okay. Um, one, one of the things that I learned, um, I used to be very shy, but these days I talk quite a bit. One of the things that I learned is that you really should not give up when you are talking to these policy uh, makers. You know, they, they have so many competing interests, depending on the political situation, depending on what the global community uh, is, is talking about. They have so many interests. So your little research is not the thing that is going to shake them out of their seats you need to go constantly with them and work with them right from the beginning so that they understand. I mean, we had so many meetings where we invited the policy makers. They didn't have a choice, but talk about the work that we were doing in their daily lives because we drummed it so much in their heads. So we shouldn't be shy. In the beginning, you go, you call them for meetings. They are busy, they will not come but you develop a, a picture of a COC card and you go to them and say, look, this is what we've done and we want to link it up with this book you're already doing. What do you think? They don't have a choice but to sit. We put them on the advisory groups. We put them, I mean, we, we took them on the travel when we were having international meetings. We, so engaging, engaging, engaging and not giving up. But we also have to make sure that it is not our little research that is going to change the world sometime. And so we, it must be timely. Um, it must be at a time where everybody is thinking of this as something that can change things on the ground. And then when it comes in at the right time, it will be able to, to, to change things. But I cannot overemphasize this issue of engaging, 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 and it, it helps. It takes time, but it helps. I think those are wise words uh, to to end on. Um, I uh, I wrote them down, <laughs> um, and and am planning on implementing some of them in in my own work. So thank you, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you so much for joining us um, at a time when it is clearly very late for you. So we appreciate. Uh, your time, your sharing of your experiences, the things you've learned, the things you've done, and, and again, uh, coming to us at a really, really late time. Um, so we will let you um, uh, rest now, uh, but, but so appreciate uh, you being with us. Thank you very much, and thanks for, for having me um, on the group. I hope that one of these days when COVID uh, is dealing with us in a better way. We'll see you in Ghana and we can collaborate on something together. Yes, and we hope to see you here as well. That's right. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you very much. And thank you okay. to all our attendees um, who, who joined us. Um, uh, I, we hope you enjoyed this. That's right. Thank you, bye. Bye. Bye.